Okay, I am going to welcome you all to uh, this evening's program where we'll be hearing from Professor Ben Wright of the University of Texas, Dallas. Um, first, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Library Company of Philadelphia, in particular the program in, uh, uh, program in African American history that I direct. And I'd like to uh, extend my thanks and gratitude to a few of my LCP colleagues. So first, uh, our director, Michael Versanti, uh, who so graciously has um, really expanded our programming to include these wonderful talks, um, particularly during the pandemic, we have adjusted, we've had a lot of virtual programs. And also uh, our colleague Deja Brock, who has literally been uh, doing such wonderful work behind the scenes um, with the program and event management, but also doing a lot of our IT work and Jasmine Smith, who is the archivist in African American history, but also helps me to run the program in African American history. So all of this would not have been possible without their, um, their labor. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. Ben Wright, I was just speaking to him briefly, is doing so much, particularly as uh, a, a pretty recent assistant professor at the University of Texas, uh, Dallas. So he's an assistant professor at uh, UT Dallas. He is the author of Bonds of Salvation, How Christianity Inspired and Limited American Abolitionism. It was published this year. So congratulations by Louise. Today, I have to say, yeah. actually, published today. Oh, oh my goodness, that's wonderful, published today. So this is a wonderful inaugural talk for you uh, as your book was published by uh, Lu Louisiana State University Press and the co-editor, uh, co excuse me, of both Apocalypse and the Millennium in the American Civil War Era, also published by LSU or Louisiana State University Press in 2013, and the American Yop, a massively collaborative open US history textbook published last year by Stanford University Press. So he has been busy. He is the managing editor of Teaching United States History. I'm going to give you that website uh, in the chat when we, when we are done. It's teachingushistory.com, a blog on college level pedagogy in US history classrooms. And he is the co-creator of abolitionseminar.org. That's abolitionseminar.org, an educational website exploring the abolitionist movement. Dr. Wright's scholarship on slavery and abolition has led to leadership positions in the modern anti-human trafficking movement. He is on the board of both Historians Against Slavery and Children at Risk. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Library Company of Philadelphia. Uh, as you said, one of your favorite places. And so I am now going to, to be quiet so that we can learn from you uh, and also, I'd like to state for, for our participants, if you have questions, if you look below, you'll see the Q&A function. You can type your questions into that and we'll open it up at the end of Dr. Wright's talk so that he can uh, have some discourse with you. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. This is so exciting for me for, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, the library company is really one of my favorite places uh, in the world. It's the most important uh, archive uh, for, for my research. Uh, I have so many fond memories of, of digging into the sources there. Uh, I'm also really thrilled to be here because I know we have uh, a great number of school teachers. And I was very briefly a high school history teacher. Uh, I never worked as hard in my life. And I still feel somewhat guilty for abandoning that kind of front post position um, um, in the academy uh, in favor of the kind of rear guard position the way I have it now. Uh, but anytime I have an opportunity to, to help support the work of, of K-12 teachers, um, I feel it, I feel it really a privilege to do so. So the conversation that you're going to get uh, today is going to be a discussion of a website that uh, really came out of the library company. I'm going to share my screen here and, and show you a couple of, of slides. Uh, but as I do so, I'll actually invite you, if you are so inclined, to go to abolitionseminar.org. Uh, what you're going to see on, on my screen are essentially stills of the website that, that I encourage you to, to take a look at both today and hopefully it'll be of use to you uh, beyond this conversation uh, as well. 
So this website came out of a National Endowment for the Humanities seminar at the library company for K-12 teachers. It was created by the great historian Richard S. Newman, um, who for four weeks uh, at the library company dug into the history of anti-slavery with school teachers, uh, both for the purpose of kind of giving a crash course in the work of academic historians, and then also then helping uh, those teachers turn that academic work into really useful practical uh, curriculum that they could bring into their very own classes. So this website kind of serves this dual purpose. It's in some ways a kind of crash course in the history of the abolitionist movement, um, uh, kind of aimed at teachers, uh, speaking to them as, as, you know, as folks interested in history. It also then is a repository for teaching tools. Uh, we've got, got images, videos, um, uh, 50 essential primary sources in the history of abolitionism, and a number of lesson plans as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do with my time here is give you a bit of a sense of how this website works. And along the way, I'm going to run through uh, the kind of curriculum side of it, the learning modules, as we call it, um, and, and in a way, give you a kind of very, very brief history of the abolitionist movement. And I'm going to flag, I think, a couple of uh, a couple of recent insights by historians that I think are particularly important uh, to bring into the classroom. And I'll do all that really as quickly as I can so we can have a robust uh, Q&A period. So without further ado, um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump in and start talking about the kind of structure uh, of this website. So really, as I said, there's kind of two ways that this works. One is as a repository of lesson plans, of primary source documents, of media. And then the other uh, is this kind of you know, crash course in the history of American abolitionism, which I'm gonna run through uh, uh, briefly here. So there are five learning modules that uh, we've kind of created to divide up the long history of the abolitionist movement. And the first starts with the 18th century Atlantic world. So that's where we're gonna start uh, our, our discussion here today. And the way that we structured this, uh, this website is really the kind of the same way that I structure my own teaching, which is always beginning with questions. Um, I, you know, I think it's very important for students to know that historians don't just you know, memorize facts. What we do is we ask and then argue uh, to answer uh, a series of questions. So these are some of the questions that historians have been most interested in wrestling with uh, in the early history of the anti-slavery movement. And the first one, in fact, comes directly uh, from one of the kind of great esteemed historians of abolitionism, David Bryan Davis. For about 50 years, he held a position at Yale and trained countless uh, academics um, in the history of abolitionism. And he has a very influential chapter in a book uh, called, What Were the Abolitionists Up Against? And so I wanna start uh, by, by discussing that, because I think it's important for us to, to recognize that you know, in our world today, we of course rightly see slavery as an immoral abnormality, as a kind of, you know, barbaric uh, moral impossibility. How could people have done this? How could people have accepted this? But the truth is, in the 18th century, uh, the, 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 actually the question is in somewhat the inverse. Why wouldn't there be a system of slavery? Um, and that assumption is drawing on really you know, centuries and in fact, millennia of Western thought. So I actually think it's valuable to start there, to start, uh, to start with the kind of origins of the ways that Western civilization thought about freedom and thought about slavery. What you've got here is we've got uh, uh, representations of Plato, Aristotle, the church fathers, St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. And the unfortunate truth is that the bodies of thought uh, upon which all of these, you know, intellectual founders of the Western tradition, uh, the intellectual foundations of all of their thought were rooted in a world that not only accepted, but in fact expected slavery to exist. Um, I, you know, I, on the website, you can find uh, a more kind of detailed engagement with the work uh, of these thinkers and other thinkers as well. Uh, but I'll start by just quickly acknowledging uh, Aristotle, uh, you know, wrote that from the hour of their birth, some are marked for subjection, others for rule. Uh, it is Aristotle's belief that that slavery was in fact a, a natural, uh, inevitable institution that should exist in the world. 
Similarly, St. Augustine saw slavery as an expected condition, as a result of sin in the world, and in fact, as God's solution to the problem of sin. He wrote, the prime cause of slavery is sin, which brings man under the dominion of his fellow. And that does not happen except by the judgment of God, with whom is no unrighteousness. So slavery is, in Augustine's view, a kind of divinely created institution. So we've got, you know, a, a long time of folks expecting uh, and sanctioning slavery. Um, we also, of course, have other elements of the Christian tradition. And I, I'm very tempted here to spend about six hours talking about this question, uh, what the Bible says about slavery. As you heard, I just finished a book on religion and the abolitionist movement. Uh, I'm going to try to restrain myself uh, and make this fairly brief. But the truth is that, you know, the Bible was the foundation of both anti-slavery and pro-slavery thought. And when folks turned to the Bible, especially in the early 19th century, they did so with what scholars call a Republican hermeneutic. It's a very fancy you know, way of essentially saying that anybody should be expected to pick up the Bible, to open it, and it says what it says. You don't need any historical context. You don't need any interpretation. Uh, and in fact, if there's an explicit statement in the Bible, that's the way it is. Now, with that Republican hermeneutic, certain Bible verses, uh, I'll give you just a couple of them, uh, provided really kind of powerful justifications for slavery. Ephesians 6, 5, for example, says servants, which actually translates to the same word that means slaves. So we can say slaves, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in signals of your heart. First Peter 2, 8, servants, slaves, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but to the harsh as well. First Timothy 6, 1, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Okay, so uh, we've got all of these Bible verses, and you'll notice I only, I, I picked ones from the New Testament. Of course, there's many more from the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, there are very kind of explicit, literal uh, uh, Bible verses that are used to justify the institution of slavery. In fact, there's a, a very kind of well-known historian named Mark Knoll who wrote a book called The Civil War as a Theological Crisis that argued that really before the Civil War, the nation ripped apart uh, over conflicting views on how to read the Bible. Um, okay, I think I've made my point. You can engage with that a little more deeply uh, on the website and in some of the other resources uh, if you're so inclined. I, I will say also, uh, those of you that are looking for other primary sources that wanna kind of engage in this, uh, I don't think that, you know, historians or teachers make enough about this really remarkable exchange of letters in the 1840s. Two Baptists, the Baptist pastor in Charleston, South Carolina named Richard Fuller, and the Baptist uh, head of Brown College named Francis Whalen. The two of them wrote letters back and forth arguing about the Bible and slavery, and the result of, of those letters was eventually published um, in, in a collection that was fairly widely read in the 1840s and the 1850s. Um, so if you want to get a sense of how uh, Americans were thinking about the relationship between Bible, the Bible and slavery, that's a fantastic primary source to go to. I'm actually in the very early phases of working with one of my graduate students on creating uh, a classroom design kind of way of walking through that document. Uh, but you don't have to wait for us. You can, you can dig into it as well. That's the, the Wayland and Fuller debates. Okay, so the point here, what were the abolition up against? We've got centuries of Western thought. We've got uh, uh, Bible verses that are being used as well. We also have the creation of an incredibly powerful legal regime, uh, which sanctions and, and justifies and really entrenches the power of slavery in the United States. And this goes all the way back to the colonial period. Now, I spent a lot of time on this with my students um, for two reasons. One, I think that it's important to note that the way that American slavery developed was in fact not inevitable. Uh, we probably are all somewhat familiar with the 1619 Project, it's excellent work in kind of showing the origins uh, of slavery in the United States. Um, but the early years of slavery in, after, in the aftermath of 1619 uh, were not like slavery would come to exist later. It was largely a temporary, fluid, 
uh, institution. That begins to change, however, in the 1660s in Virginia. On the website, we pulled out four different legal developments in uh, 1660s Virginia that really changed the way that slavery functioned. Um, briefly, I'll, I'll say that, you know, the first of these laws uh, emphasized the fact that the status of slavery will be determined matrilineally. Uh, if, if a woman is enslaved, then her offspring will be enslaved as well. This is unusual. Why would we expect a matrilineal descent when the entirety of, you know, the English legal tradition is patrilineal? Property is inherited uh, um, by fathers, aristocracies, titles are inherited by fathers. This is a reversal of, of English legal tradition, uh, but we know why that is, and that's to kind of cover up the, uh, the sexual violence that is an essential part of the slave system. Um, okay, so we've got this transformation of slavery in the 1660s where the status of slaves will be determined by the mother. We also have a unexplicit declaration that Christian conversion and baptism does not end the status of one's slavery. In the late medieval period, when slaving began to move out of fashion in Europe, um, it's a kind of long, complicated story, uh, the primary argument was that Christians shouldn't enslave other Christians. Well, this begs the question now, when Africans are being brought to the New World, or of course, Native Americans are being enslaved, uh, what happens if they convert to Christianity, which missionaries were very actively trying to make happen? Well, in the 1660s, it was decreed that Christian conversion and baptism would not bring freedom. And in fact, uh, Christianity and slavery could coexist and were both thought of as mutually reinforcing uh, to each other. Okay. The uh, other, other legal changes that happened in the 1660s emphasized the fact that enslavers cannot be held legally liable for the abuse and in fact, even the murder of their enslaved uh, laborers. Um, you can see those, those specific legal codes. So one, I think it's important to understand the kind of contingent nature of uh, slavery in the United States. It had to be created, had to be created through laws, and this is the, the kind of moment of that creation. Once these laws are on the books, they are incredibly powerful, and they really form the kind of backbone of the way that Americans think about uh, the law and slavery uh, for, for, you know, centuries. Okay. All right. Um, I, I promise the rest of this will move a little bit quicker. I'm spending a lot of time on this very early period. Um, the, the website also explores what the ideological and cultural foundations of early abolitionism are. Okay, we probably have all heard of the important role of Quakers um, in, in, in being the kind of early activists that, that uh, got the abolitionist movement off the ground. Um, I think it's, it's maybe somewhat important to reverse the order here, uh, that in fact, it's black activists and enslaved people themselves that are the first anti-slavery anti activists You'll hear me kind of talk about this a lot more later, uh, but without slave resistance, there would be no abolitionist movement. Um, so it's the resistance of enslaved people themselves. It's the activism of, of, of free black Americans uh, or, or free black Britons in North America at the time um, that is really kind of starting this movement um, in its kind of early phases. Now, when it comes to Quakers, uh, on the abolition seminar, we spend uh, a, a good bit of time here really kind of focusing um, on a number of early anti-slavery statements. Uh, the first, of course, uh, I'm, I'm speaking for the library company, we have to acknowledge up the road, uh, the Germantown protest in the late 17th century, the first North American uh, kind of codified anti-slavery statement. Um, and, and we have that statement available uh, for folks and students to, to take a look at on the website. Also then, you, there's an activity of kind of comparing it to later abolitionist uh, documents, Samuel Sewell's uh, in the early 18th century um, and others that move on. You also find there a kind of deep dive and a focus on the Quaker abolitionist, Anthony Benezet. Uh, I think it's safe to say that there is no more influential anti-slavery figure in the 18th century than Anthony Benezet. Um, so students and, and instructors can give a bit of a, a greater sense of him. And there's also a lecture uh, that will be far better than this one um, by Dr. Maurice Jackson, who is a historian at Georgetown and wrote an excellent biography of Benezet um, that, that is embedded right there in that page. So spend some time, get to know Anthony Benezet. 
uh, listen to Dr. Jackson, uh, pick up his biography if you can uh, as well. Okay, as far as uh, the black activist section here in the 18th century, uh, we have a kind of detailed discussion of the famed abolitionist, Alada Equiano, who was uh, an enslaved African uh, who writes of the transatlantic slave trade, eventually gains his freedom, ends up in Britain, uh, and writes this very kind of influential anti-slavery document. Um, of course, the, the, the uh, slave narrative of Equiano is available to all, uh, but for the purposes of, of kind of making it more accessible, uh, the historian Brick and Carey has a great kind of uh, annotated guide to Equiano's narrative, uh, breaking out kind of key quotes, giving kind of discussions of issues around Equiano, including an actually very interesting debate among historians about whether or not Equiano was in fact even born in Africa. There is a, a very influential historian at Harvard, actually he's a literary scholar, who believes that Equiano was born in South Carolina. Uh, but made up the kind of story uh, of his transatlantic passage by listening to the stories of others, knowing that it would be more impactful as a slave narrative if it talked about him uh, being being taken uh, on the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, anyway, there's a discussion of that, much more about Equiano as well. Brick and Carey walks you through that um, here. Okay, so uh, to sum up the kind of first module here of the 18th century is that as the 18th century dawns, Slavery is an expected and, and deeply justified practice in the Western Hemisphere. It forms a kind of cornerstone of Western uh, political, philosophical, uh, religious, and legal thought. We have uh, the creation of a legal regime that entrenches this as an as, as a imagined kind of permanent um, um, status. Uh, but we also have the beginning of folks pushing against that, the beginnings, the stirrings of an anti-slavery movement beginning with enslaved people themselves, uh, and then first gaining important allies uh, among Quakers. Okay. Slavery does begin to erode in the North, and we have a discussion here of gradual uh, uh, abolition laws that begin to be passed, focusing actually on Pennsylvania. Um, as the kind of the, the, the first kind of case study of this gradual emancipation law. Uh, and we look at the Pennsylvania Abolition Society formed by mostly Quakers, a few evangelicals come alongside them as well to begin to fight against slavery. But the key lesson here that I hope folks can take away is that slavery did not disappear in the North without a fight. It required real work to get rid of slavery. There's a danger that we can have, you know, the historians call it uh, uh, teleological thinking, assuming that what happened had to have happened, it was inevitable, it was not. Uh, the Civil War was not inevitable, where it's not kind of an inevitable movement of, of, of abolition in the North, um, that this was, this was a, a movement that was hard fought, uh, and that there was significant opposition to it as well. Um, so that's, that's the kind of key thing that I think folks need to get. I, I teach in Texas now, but I'm originally from Wisconsin. And I'll, I'll say that quite frankly, the, the, my education kind of let me down um, in not recognizing the importance of slavery in the North um, and the fact that slavery only disappeared in the North through really uh, tireless, difficult, long campaigns uh, led mostly by, by black activists um, but with, with notable contributions made by their Quaker allies as well. So slavery disappeared in the North, but not without a fight and not without some real significant difficulty. Okay, so uh, as I said before, the anti-slavery movement begins uh, with uh, enslaved people and with uh, free black Americans as well. The second module focuses on black activists and asks these three questions. What are the tactics that black Americans used in the fight for freedom? What was the significance of slave resistance in the abolitionist movement? And finally, how did slave narratives and protest pamphlets radicalize American abolitionists? Okay, so we'll start by the kind of early uh, American abolitionist tactics and I'll highlight uh, a few of them. First, uh, at the same time that we have the American Revolution, we also have transformations in understandings of racism at the same time. How do you at the same time believe all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights? Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How do you genuinely believe that and also live in a society that enshrines and legally protects 
the institution of slavery? The answer is you rely even more, more uh, on the belief that African descended peoples are in fact not people. Um, so we see in the late 18th century, this accelerated kind of turn uh, 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 of cultural white supremacy, of denying the humanity of African descended peoples. Black activists uh, uh, worked against that immediately and intensely. Of course, this is an era of sensibility. It's an era uh, where humanity is often kind of measured uh, by a kind of cosmopolitan sensitivity. Um, and quite frankly, you're not gonna find anything more cosmopolitan and sensitive uh, in the late 19th century than the poetry of Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, Wheatley's uh, poetic works were not simply artistic expression, they were political action. Uh, and they were a, 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 a argument against the logics uh, of slavery and white supremacy. We can say the same thing of the mathematician Benjamin Banneker, who not only did his work uh, in mathematics, but he publicized it and he in fact sent it directly to Thomas Jefferson, using it as a way of trying to rebut uh, the racist white supremacist arguments that Thomas Jefferson was making in his notes on the state of Virginia. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, by the way, both the articulator of this belief that all men are created equal, an essential uh, and radical doctrine in its time um, for the advancement of human freedom, also uh, one of the most uh, kind of uncompromising codifiers of white supremacy uh, through his writings in the late uh, 18th century. Okay, so this kind of argument of capacity, uh, this argument of sentimentality, of sensibility, uh, of co cosmopolitanism. Um, this is a, a kind of key component here um, that we're seeing. African Americans are also trying to create autonomous spaces. Um, what's interesting is in, in my book here on religion, I'm finding that for a lot of white uh, religious leaders, it's their work of kind of being leaders within their churches that then pushes them towards uh, abolitionist uh, or, or pro-slavery action. They become kind of politicized by their church work. For black Christians, the process is actually kind of the opposite. To be black and free in the 18th century is to make a political statement. Quite frankly, maybe it still makes a political statement today to be black and free, I think it probably does. Um, so black religious leaders are politicized and are using their uh, kind of community organizing to create independent spaces um, to create refuges from the, the, the horrors of slavery and of white supremacy and to organize the community um, um, in, in resistance to these. You have a picture here of Richard Allen, of course, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Mother Bethel AME Ch Church, his church, eventually his denomination. Um, there's some discussion of Allen in the website as well as you can read some of his uh, activism in the era. And what's really interesting about the way that Richard Allen uh, uh, resists white supremacy and abolition is he does so using the language of the oppressors. Um, he shows the contradictions uh, in American society between its purported ideals and its practical reality. So these abolitionist tactics are, uh, you know, um, demonstrating capacity, creating autonomy, also then manipulating the legacy of the American Revolution and trying to in fact bend it towards an equality uh, which its creators did not in fact intend. The last figure uh, we have depicted here uh, is Gabriel. Um, this is a, a, an imagined illustration. We don't have an actual uh, understanding of his appearance, um, which, which gets us to the kind of third tactic which African-Americans used in resisting slavery. And that is in fact slave resistance. Um, I, I think I made the point already briefly uh, that you can't kind of overstate the centrality of resistance and rebellion. Without those things, there would not be an abolitionist movement. Um, we also have a picture here uh, reminding us that, that black actors are not uh, uh, operating independent from a wider Atlantic world, that the Haitian Revolution and news of the Haitian Revolution rang throughout North America. Uh, white and black, slave and free, Folks were aware of this radical achievement of, of equality and of liberty uh, in Haiti. The United States crafted a very kind of coercive, oppressive foreign policy uh, to punish and prevent uh, uh, the black freedom in Haiti um, that, that succeeded in crippling um, the, the, the infant republic, but not in subduing it. And so this kind of memory uh, of black resistance 
energizes the anti-slavery movement um, and continues to kind of open the imagination for an alternate possibility uh, of, of what freedom could look like. So I guess, you know, this is going to be a bad metaphor, but if we're going to think about slave rebellion as kind of, you know, the muscle and bone um, uh, of, of the abolitionist movement, it's the work of uh, slave narratives and black protest pamphlets uh, that become the kind of the speech uh, of the movement. And in fact, I'll say that there's no better place in the world to have an understanding of the black protest tradition uh, than the library company, um, the incredible program in African American history, the really unrivaled collections of materials uh, that they have, including many of them that are available online on their websites, um, offer the kind of the best view at understanding uh, the role of testimony uh, of, of, of formerly enslaved people in uh, kind of organizing and inspiring additional abolitionist action. Okay, I'm gonna move a little more quickly here to make sure we have time for questions. The third uh, learning module focuses on the transformation of American abolitionism. And we, we stole this title from Rich, the, the creator of the seminar, his great book. Um, and this focuses on three questions. How did abolitionists come to adopt confrontational tactics? We've talked about slave resistance, which obviously is an important part of, of abolitionist action, but that's not what Quakers are doing. Uh, Quakers uh, and, and the kind of white anti-slavery activists in the early Republic are not really being fairly confrontational. Um, that changes, how and why. Second, what role did political mobilization play in American abolitionism? How does this play out uh, you know, in, in, in Congress, um, in, in political movements? And finally, how did women change the abolitionist movement? So I wanna start with this kind of uh, conversation about uh, uh, the, the rise of confrontational tactics and the transformation of American abolitionism. This is something I really emphasize with my students uh, is I want all of my students to know four events uh, that led to the transformation of American abolitionism. Uh, we might you know, call this the kind of move from gradual uh, abolitionism, the belief that slavery should go away gradually to the insistence that it goes away immediately. Um, this is a kind of older way of thinking about the abolitionist movement, which has some limits, but it, it, still, it still works in some, in some ways. Okay, so these moments of transformation, four events that I want my students to know, all take place around the year 1830. We start in 1829, when a free black man named David Walker uh, writes his appeal to the colored citizens of the world. David Walker's appeal, I think, is one of the most notable underread documents in all of American history. Um, it, it's really, really spectacular. Uh, went through three editions. Uh, you can find links to Walker's appeal on the abolitionseminar.org. Uh, I'll also give a plug to, uh, it was mentioned my textbook project, uh, the American Yop, which is free and open online. Uh, anybody's free to read it, to use it, to copy it, to essentially copy it and customize it in ways that are more useful for your students. There is an open uh, license on it. And that's available at AmericanYop.com. Uh, we also have uh, David Walker's appeal and some of these other documents uh, on that, we uh, res that, that website, which might be helpful for you too. So Walker's appeal in 1829 calls into question the very Christianity of white Americans. He's not willing to grant that white Americans are even Christian given the existence of slavery in the United States. This kind of language marks a change in the ways that anti-slavery folks were expected to behave and in which the ways that they largely kind of spoke. Gone was the attempt to kind of, you know, achieve a kind of consensus uh, or to, you know, um, chip away at the institution of slavery. Now, now there's an insistence that this is what's right and it has to change now. Walker, in fact, even alludes to the fact that if enslaved people rebel and in fact even rebel violently, that is just and God would be on their side. That's not the kind of thing that Quakers would be saying uh, at this time. Uh, it's a much kind of more confrontational uh, language starting in 1829. He also condemns the colonizationist movement, the attempt to solve the problem of slavery by relocating black Americans to West Africa, the colony that eventually became Liberia. Walker condemns this and says that, you know, enslaved people built the United States, black Americans are productive and essential components of the nation. This colonizationist movement should not happen. Walker's appeal in 29. Many of the same ideas that Walker has enter the mouth of a white person starting in 1831 
when William Lloyd Garrison begins publishing his abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. You can find a link to the first uh, edition of The Liberator on abolitionseminar.org, which I think is really useful to put in front of students. Um, it's, it's easy to read, which is fairly notable for you know, an early 19th century document. He wants to be accessible to all people, and he wants to be incredibly clear on what he's saying, which is that slavery is evil, and it has to go away immediately. And in his attempt to try to make sure that that happens, he's not going to be polite about it. Uh, and in fact, he, he kind of thunders in all caps, let Southern oppressors tremble. Let Northern defenders tremble. He's predicting violence uh, in, in this very first edition of the Liberator in 1831. That comes out in January of 1831. By August, it seems like Garrison's promise is coming real with Nat Turner's rebellion in Southampton, Virginia. Now we're about to get a really exciting book on the Southampton riots uh, by a historian named Vanessa Holden, who's gonna uh, very convincingly, I think, argue that Nat Turner's Rebellion shouldn't be called Nat Turner's Rebellion, it should be called the Southampton Rebellion. Because it's not just Turner, uh, it's in fact this entire community that organized uh, the largest uh, slave rebellion in antebellum US history. So this transformation of abolitionism, we've got four events. We've done Walker's Appeal in 29, the two in 31, the Liberator and uh, uh, Nat Turner's Rebellion. Then in 1833, Great Britain announces gradual emancipation in the Caribbean. This uh, does several things. One, it scares enslavers. They begin to be afraid that they're gonna be surrounded by anti-slavery sentiment in the North and abolitionists in the Caribbean. Uh, we'll start to see pro-slavery folks be more aggressive uh, and more kind of paranoid uh, in, in their ideas. We also see uh, Brit Britons begin to kind of rub it in the face of Americans. You call yourself a free country. We as Britons have abolished slavery, which is kind of not true, but they obviously took a, a much more dramatic and radical action than the United States did. Um, the document you he see here on the right uh, is, is a abolitionist rally, which actually notes that, uh, that, that you know, emancipation has occurred in the Caribbean, we should have it occur here as well. So this is a moment of transforming uh, anti-slavery sentiment. Okay, once anti-slavery sentiment is, is transformed and there's an expectation of confrontation, we see a new political uh, nature of the activity. First, through the goal of moral suasion, trying to convince people that slavery is wrong, the mail campaign, which starts mailing abolitionist literature to Southern households. That, however, gets squashed. Uh, free speech is thrown out the window. Abolitionist publications are labeled as incendiary and a danger to public safety. And so you can't put them through the mail. Um, they, this is an abolitionist tactic that is stymied. The next abolitionist tactic is, well, if we can't mail it, what if we just get them in the newspaper? The way we can get in the newspaper is by having them read on the floor of Congress where in Congress, you would print the petition. That's stymied as well. The so-called gag rule, uh, which is enacted uh, first in uh, May of 1836 and lasts for a full eight years, a little over eight years to December of 1844, where abolitionist periodicals could not be read on the floor of Congress. This convinces some uh, abolitionists like William Garrison, uh, William Lloyd Garrison that the United States in its constitution is kind of just corrupt. He burns the constitution, turns his back on politics and says, we're never gonna solve this problem by legal change. Others disagree. And we have the formation of the Liberty Party, uh, the first abolitionist political party uh, formed in 1840. The Free Soil Party joins in 1848. Uh, the Free Soil Party is definitely not an abolitionist party, but it is a party that does have anti-slavery ideals. Um, they, they don't like slavery partially because of racist beliefs that it just expands the presence of blackness. Um, but they do have the kind of doctrine that slavery should not expand in the West, which is of course the same doctrine that the Republicans will adopt in 1850 when that party uh, develops. So you can track these movements on the website. We also have the political platforms of the Liberty Party, the Free Soil Party and the Republican Party. So you can see how anti-slavery ideas manifest themselves in the, uh, the actual political parties uh, in the United States. Of course, the folks that are doing a lot of the work in the abolitionist movement are women. 
Here we have Lydia Maria Child, who was already famous as a children's writer, Sojourner Truth, who we of course know, uh, and we have a representation of the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Women were doing the, the, the work. They made up the majority of membership in all anti-slavery societies. Um, and in doing this work, we begin to see women uh, kind of come to a greater awareness of one, their capacity as agents of change, and two, uh, the connection of, of kind of toxic masculinity and the institution of slavery. Uh, women, I think, rightly kind of recognized uh, that the injustices of society were perpetuated by patriarchy. And if we want to fix these injustices, uh, the kind of best way to do so would be to undercut the power of patriarchy and perpetuating those injustices. Okay, I want to get to questions, so I'm going to move uh, into the Civil War here, where here we ask three questions. Did abolitionists cause a civil war? Uh, what, what caused the civil war? Who freed the slaves? How did emancipation actually come? And then how did Americans react to emancipation? Now, there's this kind of uh, mythological meeting between Abraham Lincoln and Harriet Beecher Stowe, of course, Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, where Stowe comes to the White House and Lincoln is purported to have said, uh, so this is the little lady that started this great big war. Now, first of all, he probably didn't say that. Um, and second, this is a kind of, you know, obviously a mythologized uh, truth. However, there would not have been a civil war in the United States had it not been for abolitionist uh, activity. The, now, the war starts because the South secedes, okay? And the South secedes because they are paranoid and believe that slavery is under a threat that, in fact, it wasn't. So, in a way, the great achievement of abolitionism is creating a sense of paranoia that inspires white Southerners to make a rash and foolish action. The truth was that the white South, largely because of the three-fifths compromise, still had a stranglehold on federal power. If it wasn't for this one moment of a kind of meltdown within the Democratic Party, the South would have maintained its power in, uh, in Congress and, and, uh, and likely holding the White House as well. But uh, there's this kind of weird moment that happens generally because Southerners start to insist um, that the nation uh, not only tolerate slavery, but in fact embrace it. And they're doing this, imagining that as the kind of necessary corrective to abolitionist action. So uh, I'm here in Texas where the frustrating uh, myth that the Civil War was caused by states' rights continues to endure, which is deeply frustrating. Often history is very complicated. Uh, sometimes it's not, however. And uh, the, the Civil War was started by Southern secession, which was motivated by a desire to preserve slavery, full stop. If, however, we do want to think about the relationship of doctrines of states' rights in the coming of the Civil War, we should think about the person at the, at the, at the center of our screen here, which is a, a, a man named Anthony Burns. Burns had escaped from slavery in Virginia and was living in Boston. However, after the second Fugitive Slave Act, or not the second, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was passed, he was arrested, he was tried, and he was sent back uh, into slavery in Virginia. When this happened, Bostonians, many of whom were very racist themselves, many of them whom really didn't even like abolitionism, but hated the notion that the federal government would be the lapdog of enslavers and would take this person, um, arrest them, so much so that there was a riot in Boston when Anthony Burns uh, was arrested. So this is only one of many very kind of publicized uh, cases in the North of Northerners wanting to resist the fugitive slave law. And if you take a look at Southern secession, the only time there's a really clear mention of questions of states' rights versus federal power, it's when the seceding states are complaining that Northern states have too much power to resist the, the federal law of enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. So abolition has caused a civil war. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe certainly did not. Uh, the experience of Anthony Burns and his, uh, the kind of resistance to the Fugitive Slave Act was fairly consequential. And of course, uh, secessionists do frequently mention John Brown um, and his uh, brand of trying to foment slave rebellion in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Okay. So we know civil war happens and we know emancipation eventually happens. Who freed the slaves? 
Uh, now, most of the students that come to me uh, still see Abraham Lincoln as the great emancipator. That's their answer to this question. Um, there is increasingly a new generation of students, I will say, I'm starting to see this, that say that who freed the slaves, the slaves freed themselves. And I appreciate this kind of new perspective. I'd like to give you a little bit more complexity and suggest that as we think about this question, we have a five part answer. It in fact does begin with the action of enslaved people themselves. Less than a month after the first battle of Bull Run, we have enslaved people showing up en masse to Fort Monroe uh, and forcing the Union Army to make a decision about what to do with these people. Now, according to the law of the land, the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, that the army should in fact return these people to their enslavers, and in fact not doing so would make these American soldiers liable for prosecution. However, it's the action of the man on the bottom left here, Benjamin Butler, who decides that, no, we're not gonna return these people, we're gonna label them contraband of war. So who freed the slaves? Enslaved people forced the issue themselves by running to the Union Army. Union commanders like Butler and others decided that they would be offered a type of protection uh, from the institution. Then we have black Americans enlisting and fighting in the war. Abraham Lincoln went through a change of heart. He was a racist. Uh, by the end of his life, a lot of that racism had softened. Uh, he didn't really care that much about black freedom early in his political career. But during the war, it's, it's largely the, his experience seeing black soldiers in uniform that makes him convinced that black Americans uh, are eligible for citizenship and therefore the institution of slavery really does have to go. So enslaved people running to union, union lines, union commanders granting them a type of freedom, black Americans fighting in the war, leading to changes in Lincoln's mind, which of course leads to the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation transforms the Union Army then from an army that previously had been fighting solely to preserve Union. Now with every step the Union Army makes, they bring freedom with them as well. This is a transformation of the function of the Union Army um, and the Union Army becomes an agent of emancipation as well. Okay. Um, and then, of course, we bounce back to the Republican Party with the 13th Amendment, uh, which I do think the movie Lincoln does a fairly good job of showing how difficult it was to actually pass the end of slavery. Um, uh, that's a fun thing to kind of, you know, you can pull moments from that movie in, in the classroom. Okay, so this question of who freed the slaves, uh, um, I, I, think, I think that's important for us to reckon with, but I think it's also important not to end with this kind of moment of triumph of emancipation because that's not really what happened in US history. How did Americans respond to emancipation? Short answer is not well. We have uh, a period in US history where terrorists win. Um, I'm fairly unequivocal about this. The story of reconstruction is the story uh, of, of law uh, uh, falling before uh, kind of consistent, widespread, violent white vigilante terrorism. We have a, a scene here depicting uh, the so-called riot in Memphis. Uh, I really think it's important that we don't use the word riot to talk about what happens in Reconstruction. Uh, what, what the right word is actually acts of terrorism, uh, where the black community was essentially driven out of the city of Memphis. We have other uh, elaborate organized vigilante killings in New Orleans, in, in Colfax, Louisiana, and all over uh, the South, trying to prevent black freedom from really taking root. We also have the creation of a new type of slavery that comes directly out of emancipation, comes out of reconstruction, in fact, comes out of the Union Army. And that's the creation of the convict leasing system. General Thomas Ruger, who was a military commander in Georgia, sells uh, a, a number of black uh, prisoners to a corporation to work as unpaid labor. This is the beginning of what becomes a massive system that uh, a great historian calls slavery by another name or neo-slavery. Uh, uh, we also can call it the convict leasing system. A, a new type of slavery that comes out of the 13th Amendment, we of course know the great loophole in the 13th Amendment is that if somebody is convicted of a crime, they can be enslaved and forced to labor without, without pay. Okay. Uh, we can also maybe broach the conversation about uh, what sharecropping is. I'm gonna uh, move to talking about modern slavery, but a type of modern slavery that we look at today is called debt peonage, 
where folks are kind of trapped in cycles of loaning, uh, of, of being kind of required to take out loans that they cannot repay. Uh, and therefore they do not have the freedom of mobility, the freedom of negotiation, um, and are in fact kind of, you know, enslaved by this economic trap. Um, historians have not really talked about sharecropping as a type of, uh, of new slavery. And I think for, for some good reasons, uh, but it's also worth maybe us questioning what freedom actually means uh, under some of the, the realities of sharecropping in the postbellum period. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna go into, into a lot of detail here about thinking about the relationship between historical slavery and modern slavery. Uh, I'm just gonna leave you with maybe two, um, two encouragements uh, with three, I'll say three encouragements uh, about how you can hopefully talk about this in your classes. First, I'll ask you to talk about it. That's the first, it's a very low bar. Uh, make sure that it's clear uh, to your students that slavery doesn't end in 1865. It doesn't even end when the convict leasing system is ended in World War II, um, that, that uh, in fact, slavery continues uh, to haunt our world and in fact, to haunt still the United States as well. However, when we talk about that, the second thing that I think it's really important that we do is not sensationalize discussions of modern slavery. Um, you know, we, we, all, we all know the kind of absurdity of the Liam Neeson movie Taken and still people's kind of understanding and expectations of what slavery looks like in the world today is, 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 is kind of distorted and, and, and uh, saturated by these understandings uh, of, of, of kind of, you know, radical violence um, um, and, and the rest. The truth of what modern slavery is, is it's just the full extension of poverty. Um, so that moved me to my third kind of comment about, I hope that when we talk about modern slavery, we can stop obsessing over sex trafficking. Um, I, I speak about modern slavery a lot and I was at Calvin College uh, uh, in Michigan. And the day before I, I gave my talk, uh, the president of the university did a little video about sex trafficking that started by saying sex trafficking is the most common form of modern slavery. And that's not true. In fact, it makes up less than one fifth of all modern enslaved people. Yet we talk about that kind of ad nauseum partially because it's sensational and also partially because it frees us, uh, at least you know, most of us of our kind of complicity with modern slavery. I have never bought a sex slave. Uh, I however buy goods that are produced by unfree laborers all of the time. Um, the truth of modern slavery is simply a truth of global capitalism and it's the truth of global poverty. Uh, if we wanna understand the problem of modern slavery, we have to recognize its relationship uh, to the modern international economic system. Okay, that was so much. Uh, I think, you know, Rich had a, a crazy idea of combining all of the history of the abolitionist movement into one month. And I had the more absurd idea of trying to get through a brief discussion of it uh, in 45 minutes, which I'm sure I went over. Um, so I actually want to stop so we can get some questions. And thank you for indulging me. Thank you so, so, so much. Um, this was such an engaging talk. I guess you can see from the, uh, we were talking earlier, Ben and I are in a different time zone. So <laughs> it's getting a little dark. I have to turn on my, my ring light so you can see me now. Um, thank you so very much. That was, uh, in fact, one of the, uh, the folk who sent in a, uh, a comment in the chat said this was so, um, it was a lot of information you know, and the way in which you kind of syncretized it, you made it really digestible, I think is a, a real gift. So I'm going to go to the Q&A. Yeah. And I invite you all to please uh, offer up your, your questions, your comments. So the first is um, from Jacqueline Dukes. And uh, her question is the fact that freedom begins with a group is true. How do we convince training institutions and teachers to lead with this fact? Okay, so I think I understand this question. Uh, Jacqueline, you can chime in if, if, I'm, if I'm misinterpreting. Uh, but I think what you're saying, the fact that freedom begins um, with a group, uh, meaning that, that it's in fact the unfree uh, that are that are kind of beginning the the process of their own liberation. Uh, I think that's what you mean. Hopefully, that's the case. Uh, how do we get folks to 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 understand and recognize that? Listen, uh, okay, I, I'm a white guy, uh, and and there is no way that we can talk about the the history and realities of slavery and abolitionism without talking about uh, race and without talking about the kind of 
um, the, the, the lingering legacy of slavery and the kind of uh, place that that has in our cultural psyche. Um, so I think one of the things that, that has to happen is white people have to fully accept um, uh, the, the, the power uh, and the damage of white supremacy in the past and in the present. Um, and without kind of having that recognition, I think that we will still have this kind of, this powerful need to find white heroes uh, and really what is ultimately uh, a, a stories of black suffering and black resistance. Um, so you're getting a quasi spiritual answer from me here. Uh, what do we need? Uh, I think we need to kind of recognize, um, yeah, we have, we have to recognize the, the, the fact that, that, that white interests um, in, in creating kind of white heroes uh, has distorted the past and, and continues to threaten to do that as well. I'm sorry, I'm speaking and I'm muted. Um, thank you so much. So another question from Jean Prochno, I hope I'm pronouncing the surname correctly, uh, asks, were abolitionists also racist? First of all, my high school football coach was, was a proc now, so I, I have respect for your, your, your last name. Also, I'm kind of intimidated imagining that you might know him, but anyway. Uh, I appreciate this question, were abolitionists also racist? Short answer is mostly. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is mostly. Uh, what is our expectation for, for racism um, and non-racism? Um, there's, there's a lot of ways I could say this. So maybe one way I'll, I'll address this is, there's a very prominent uh, book about uh, the Republican Party by a story named James Oakes, uh, who argues that the Republican Party was a party of abolition kind of from the very beginning. Um, and that they are using a kind of variety of tactics to achieve as many political victories as they seem, uh, as they deem possible. Um, that They are a political party. They're not, you know, just kind of radicals ranting on the street corner. And if they want to get things done, they have to be kind of practical uh, about that. Um, and I, I think that that's a very kind of convincing and powerful uh, argument. However, one of the frustrations I have with that argument is that when I look at kind of Republican politicians, how many of them were prepared and willing to live uh, in a biracial republic? Um, and the answer is very, very, very few. Uh, this is really why the American Colonization Society, uh, which you know increasingly is at the center of historians' work on the abolitionist movement, you know, formed in 1815 um, by Presbyterians, I would note. Um, that's, that's one of the things that I kind of focus on. Um, it, you know, with the goal of solving the problem of slavery by relocating Black Americans to Africa. I mean, this is insane. There is no way this is going to work. Uh, there's no way that it's going to, you know, do even a tenth of the things that they're promising that it will do. But it's that fantasy and that fiction that it will work is what is enabling um, even abolitionists uh, to, to kind of fight against slavery without having to reckon with the fact that that means they're gonna have to learn to live with black people. Um, I don't know if that was as helpful as I wanted it to be, but that, that's maybe one way of thinking about this question of, you know, about racism. The short answer I give my students is that there's like six non-racist white people in the 19th century. Uh, you know, it, <laughs> that's probably it, um, yeah. All right, thank you. So Jasmine Yarish uh, asks or, or says, so it's a comment and a question. When you teach reconstruction, do you only teach it in the context of the South? In Black Reconstruction, W.E.B. Du Bois notes that reconstruction was the first true phase towards democratization in the United States in its entirety. Why do historians continue to leave out the rest of the US when doing work on reconstruction and in parentheses, both its first, second, and now possibly its third iteration? Wow, I love this question and I really, really appreciate it. Um, so one, I mean, I, my, my, my plea for this is I had, you know, four minutes to talk about reconstruction. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so, so, so so you're absolutely correct, is that Reconstruction is a national story. Um, and Reconstruction, you know, it, it involves not just the kind of repairing of the Union, but also the creation of what a new United States is going to look like. 
Um, the way that I teach that actually um, is, is, is kind of emphasizing the creation of the modern state, uh, uh, the creation of, of the kind of um, industrial capitalist uh, nation that, you know, the, the boundaries between the Gilded Age and Reconstruction uh, are, are, you know, are kind of non-existent. Um, you know, I, I lean really heavily on Richard White's Railroaded, which I think is just a kind of very clear and really fun uh, story of the kind of corruption and absurdity uh, of, of the kind of political economy of the United States in this period. Um, yeah, so, so I think and I think the way that you can get there too is as I try to lay the groundwork by having my students really read through the Republican Party platform uh, of 1850, uh, um, I'm sorry, 1860, uh, because it's not only, you know, a helpful kind of corrective to understanding what the Republican Party was from the kind of distortions that white Southerners, which were, which had this kind of crazy view of it, but it also gives you a kind of blueprint of what the United States is going to look like uh, in, in the aftermath of the Civil War. Um, that of course, during the war itself, the federal government is being remade uh, because you know most of the Democrats in the United States are not in the United States at that time. Um, so Republicans are, are transforming the American economy um, um, and, and we see the kind of fruit of that really bloom in reconstruction and then create the inequalities that we have um, in, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Thank yeah. you. So this uh, question came earlier from James Robb. You didn't mention the very first law passed by the old Confederation Congress, the Northwest Ordinance, which has a section which prohibits, quote, involuntary servitude except in the punishment of a crime, end quote. How did this play out in what today has become Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and a part of Minnesota? Yeah. Okay, I have to proceed with some caution here because, uh, yeah. I'm gonna do my best. So this is a really important point and I appreciate this question. And this is actually a really important thing to remember when we think about conversations about, you know, uh, about prohibiting slavery in the West, you know, the Missouri crisis, uh, the, uh, you know, Talmadge amendment, uh, the Wilmot proviso, all of those later events to try to prevent the spread of slavery in the West are appealing to this earlier, um, this earlier precedent of the Northwest Ordinance that in fact did prohibit slavery in this region. Now your question is how did it play out on the ground? Um, well, one, uh, there were slaves uh, in, these, in these regions. Uh, you know, as we know from the story of Indian removal, what the law says and what the way that the law is enforced are often two different things. Um, and so we do have enslaved people uh, that are in these regions where it's legally prohibited for them to be enslaved, but it's happening. But more notably, uh, uh, we have um, we have the kind of you know a predecessor of an aboli a racist abolitionism, uh, a white supremacist abolitionism, in that you know in Ohio there is a law uh, for a while that black people are simply not allowed to be in the state of Ohio, uh, the territory of Ohio. Um, the the so-called black laws in these regions um, are, are are being passed, are being challenged. Uh, are being flouted. Um, you know, the other thing we have to remember too is the United States is a new country uh, that, that's trying to figure out how to govern this kind of vast uh, tract of land. Tracts of land, which by the way, are still mostly under control of Native Americans. Um, I, you know, this is a theme that really kind of didn't come through in this conversation, but you can't think about the history of American slavery and history of American abolitionism without the backdrop of settler colonialism. Um, and the kind of, you know, imagined erasure of indigenous people who are not being erased, who are still living and are still kind of controlling large chunks of this land. So attempts to kind of enforce the law uh, in territory where Native Americans are still often in large parts of the, of, of the old Northwest, um, exerting kind of more control and power than ter territorial governments means that whatever the law is, is, is going to mean what the actual practical reality are going to look quite different. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, I think you did a great job in answering that. Um, so we have about, my goodness, a little less than 10 minutes. So maybe um, two more questions. So in the order that they came, Stephanie Santaro uh, asks, do you have any insight about women starting their own abolitionist societies because they weren't allowed in the men's societies? And how this also led women to begin thinking about their own subjugation to men during this time, 
and the segregation practiced by white women in these biracially led groups? And thank you for that question. I, I, I am not, I'm, I'm prematurely not satisfied with the answer that I'm gonna give you today. So if you want a better one, send me an email. And let me go back and, and think about this in a deeper way. I will say the first thing that comes to mind for me is a, a book by uh, Stacy Robertson called Hearts Beating for Liberty which focuses on uh, women abolitionists in, in the old Northwest, in, in the same Midwestern area that I was talking about. Um, and, and their kind of uh, abolitionist action, which looks very different than abolitionist action on the coast. So when we talk about the abolitionist movement, this didn't come through too. We have regional variation, uh, you know, uh, and, and also we do have gendered variation as well. Um, in the Midwest, well, female abolitionists were, were much more active in the free produce movement, trying to create kind of consumerisms that didn't play into uh, slave systems um, and in, you know, anti-slavery, organizing anti-slavery fairs um, that, would, that would kind of raise money um, and, and, and the like. So those are some kind of tentative answers I can give you now, but I wanna think more about that. If you, if you actually think of it, send me an email. Yeah, and if I may too, um... Just to think about a book. I don't even know if it's still in print. I hope that it is, but it was edited by uh, Dorothy Porter and it's called Early Negro Writings. And so you'll find some of the writings by some of the early black abolitionists like Mariah Stewart in those kinds of literary societies. So they would have these titles like the New York Literary Society, but these were really groups of black women who were also um, motivated by abolition. So looking at some of those primary sources might also help in uh, early Negro writings, which was edited by Dorothy Porter. Th thank you for that. I am so glad you mentioned Mariah Stewart. Her, her I mean, she's incredible. Um, and actually we don't have her on abolitionseminar.org yet. We got to fix that. Uh, but we, you, there is a source from her on the American Yop. Um, yeah. So if you look for her on the American Yop, you can pull uh, some of her fantastic abolitionist writings. Um, and, and she, by the way, is very kind of quickly uh, she, attacking both slavery and uh, racial inequality, white supremacy in the North at the same time. Right. Yeah. Another, uh, and I'll have um, just one more question, but someone asked about your email address. So you can email Professor Wright at B, as in Ben, G, W, so B, G, W, at UT Dallas, Dot edu. Once again, that's bgw at utdallas.edu. So the last question, and they, they've been coming in, but I'm going to end um, asking a Jane Hickman question, which is, please talk more about poverty and how that continues to affect attitudes towards descendants of former slaves, which I think is great because this really goes into the talk of reparations. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're not going to hear anything from me that, that that's going to approach the kind of, you know, power and eloquence of the Donna AC Quotes piece that we all probably know and have read. And if you haven't, you got to do it, the case for reparations. Um, I mean, it, it, it's just incredibly clear that, you know, uh, American wealth is generational wealth and, uh, and, and, and generational obstacles uh, to black wealth are just kind of undeniable uh, uh, barriers. So, you know, I mean, uh, America has always had a mythology uh, of capitalism that's not reflected of the kind of actual lived realities of how capitalism functions. Uh, as a result of that, we've never really kind of understood um, the nature of poverty. Um, there's also, well, yeah, I, that's, that's a digression. I was gonna say, if, if you're like me and are interested in history of American religion, there's a, there's a remarkable book um, called Divided by Faith uh, that talks about the ways that American Christianity actually kind of sets us up to not be able to understand the presence of structural inequalities uh, and even the presence of kind of economic barriers, um, this kind of notion of individualism um, that, that's kind of nurtured by, by a Christianity that emphasizes an individual connection of believer and, and, and savior, um, obscures the power of institutions uh, and structural inequalities. So, boy, what, what an impossible question to, to, to talk about softly, but there's, there's, there's a few things. You did so it's almost as if you did it right on, on time and on cue. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending this really informative talk. Um, it has just been, I think, wonderful 
to not just have Professor Wright discuss these topics with us um, in this slice of American history, but also as I'm looking in the chat, the ways in which this has been a real engaged discussion, even without hearing your voices, just the book suggestions um, have really been great for me to, to kind of dispel a myth that some uh, professional historians have that, oh, you know, people are not interested in history. The US is a historical wasteland. And I'm like, have you ever been to the talks? That, that we sponsor, that we give. So this, this really disproves that. So thank you all. I'm looking at some of the comments, fantastic lecture and discussion. Um, so thank you, Professor Wright. I hope that we can do this again. And that email address again, bgw at utdallas.edu. I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you to my colleagues um, behind the scenes who helped to put this together and happy holidays. <laughs>